The title of tonight's message is uh, simply thank you, Lord. And before we get started, I'd like to pray one last time to make sure we got everything calmed down and ready to go. God, I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for a chance to be here tonight and to share your word. Thank you for all those who have come out into the darkness in order to hear a message about the light. Be with us, dear Lord. I ask that you use me as your vessel. In Jesus' name. Our focus text, and he's already read one of them there in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. If you want to put your finger in a couple other places, Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 22, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. This is really, really hard. We talked about it this morning, and we're just going to continue this morning's sermon on for those who are there, but it's hard to be thankful no matter what. I mean, we're supposed to be thankful no matter what. We read about it. But it's hard to be thankful no matter what. A lot harder than you think it would be. I mean, thanking God for the things he's done ought to come naturally. Thanking people for the things that they've done ought to come naturally. But I tell you what, a lot of things happen in life that make it really difficult for us to have thanksgiving in our heart. You lost your job? Thank you, God. I lost my job. Is that the way you feel? Yeah, it's a little more difficult when you start putting some wheels on it, isn't it? Whenever you start thinking about the things you go through in life, maybe you've lost your health. Thank you, God. I've got cancer. Is that the way we act? It's challenging, isn't it? A lot harder than you think it might be. Or possibly you've lost a loved one. Lost my dad this last year. Tell you what, it's challenging sometimes. Lost my mom a few years before that. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon comes. I used to dial them up. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, just about every day, and call them. 3 o'clock comes sometimes, and I'm still thinking I ought to give them a call, and the phone lines don't reach that far. Just the way it works. It can be really, really hard to be thankful when bad things are happening in life. Let me share a story with you about a man who had drawn the short straw in life. I mean, it seemed as if everything was going wrong for him. Had a pretty good life up front, but boy, all at once, he hit a point in his life where everything went haywire. He was a good man, but he was accused of being bad. I mean, he was a really good man, but he was accused of being bad. As a result, he was falsely imprisoned. Threw him right into jail, slammed the door behind him. I mean, he had every right to be bitter. He hadn't done anything wrong, and there he was sitting in a jail cell. Had every right to be bitter, but he wasn't. Every time he heard the footsteps coming down the corridor, can you just imagine? And he's wondering to himself, is this the time they're going to take me away to lop off my head? (laughs) I'm thinking how I'd be feeling if I was facing that. I would probably be terrified, but not this man. It didn't rattle him one bit. There he sat in that cold jail cell on a bed that was as hard as a rock, his feet resting on floors made of cold stone. I'm guessing the walls were all moldy and dirty. He'd been a prisoner in that cell for literally months. Not one moment passed when he was free from the constant irritation of the shackles that he wore. They cut deep into his flesh. And it hurt like crazy. This man had been separated from his family, from his friends. He was there in that jail cell. Unjustly accused and brutally treated. If ever a person had a right to complain, to cry out, God, this isn't fair, that was one of them. But instead of complaints... This is amazing. Instead of complaints, this man lifted his voice in praise to God. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving came off of his lips in spite of all that he was facing. There wasn't a jail ever built that could rob him of his freedom. The freedom he had in Jesus Christ, his Lord. This man was the Apostle Paul. A man who had learned the meaning 
of being truly thankful. A man who had learned to be thankful even in times of suffering. <laughs> Once when Paul was in prison in Rome, he wrote words that are found there in Ephesians chapter 5. They were read earlier. We'll look at them again here. It says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord in your heart. It's not just an outward thing. If all you're doing is going through the motions and saying the words, you've missed the point. You need to be singing from what's inside of you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, I know I'm in prison, but you've got this. That's the kind of faith we need to have. He goes on to say, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what Paul's saying. He's saying we need to give thanks for absolutely everything, the good and the bad. We should give thanks no matter what kind of circumstances we are facing. Our thankfulness isn't based on what's going on around us. Sometimes we want to base it on that, but it's not to be based on what's going on around us. Our thankfulness is based on what's going on inside of us. God has cleansed our hearts. He has filled us with His Spirit. We get to be called His children. That is something you can be thankful for, no matter how bad the outward circumstances might be. Our hearts have been cleansed, you see, by the grace of Almighty God. Our hearts have been filled by the Spirit of Almighty God. Our eternity is held in the hands of Almighty God, and no one, no one, can take it away from us. Now we can choose to turn our back on God, but I promise you, He will never turn out. He will never turn His back on, on us as long as we've got breath in life. If you're breathing and you want to come to Him, you know what? He stands there like that father in the story of the prodigal son, with open arms, and He says, "Come home, come to me. I love you. You're my son. You're my child. That's the way our God is." Now that's something to be truly thankful for. Thanksgiving for the Apostle Paul, it wasn't a once a year celebration. It was a daily reality for him. I, am, I can find something to be thankful for even in this jail cell. You know what? Have you ever heard of Corey Tim Boone? She said she learned to be thankful for the lice in the concentration camp. Her dorm, if you will, became infested with lice. And when they came to mistreat women, they chose the dorms without the lice. So even the lice, the lice brought a blessing to Corey Tim Boone. You can find ways to be thankful for even the things that seem bad in life. Thanksgiving. The giving of thanks. Giving thanks to God for all of His blessings, whether they seem to be good or bad as they come upon us, He can always make them right. You know, that kind of thanksgiving, that kind of a heart, that should be one of the distinctive marks or characteristics, if you will, of a believer. We should be able to be thankful in all circumstances. We mustn't allow a spirit of ingratitude to harden our hearts. We mustn't allow our ingratitude to destroy our relationship with Almighty God or our relationship with people. Nothing turns someone bitter quicker than an ungrateful heart. And nothing will do more to restore contentment than rediscovering your joy. A joy that comes not from outward circumstances, but a full knowledge of what Jesus has done in here. The joy that comes from knowing that we can rest in the hands of Almighty God. Friends, we serve an awesome God. And Jesus proved this again and again. <laughs> I love one of the examples that he gives in one of the stories he tells there about ten men, ten lepers, if you will. These lepers, they, they avoided people. In the ancient world, men, they were to be most pitied. These ten lepers, I mean, they had it really, really rough. In the ancient world, they were actually feared. Somebody saw a, a leper coming down through, and he's crying out, Behold, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. He had a communicable disease. That means if they touched him, they could get it. They didn't want it, so they stayed as far away from him as they could possibly be. 
because those who contracted leprosy, they, they were left with a pretty hopeless life. Many times they were disfigured beyond recognition. The disease forced them to be completely cut off from their family and their friends for the rest of their days unless a miracle happened. When they saw someone approaching them and they cried out unclean, in essence they were saying, I can have no human contact unless they are exactly as I am. Without exception. Every leper longed for one thing. To be made clean. To be made well. On this particular day, ten lepers were approaching Jesus just outside of the village. And they began to plead with Jesus. <laughs> he told them where to go, what to do. And as they headed off, all ten of them were cleansed. Their skin was made baby bottom soft. Can I say that in church? They're made baby bottom soft. I mean, it was just beautiful skin. But out of those ten who were completely healed, only one came back to thank Jesus. All the rest, they went on without a single word of thanksgiving. Their minds were preoccupied. They wanted to see the priest. They wanted to head home. They were overwhelmed with a spirit of ingratitude toward the one who had healed them. You know, in today's world, ingratitude is far, far too common. I don't know if you notice, but there's some real brats out there in the world. They forget to thank their parents for provisions, for their love, for life itself. They... They treat their parents as if they're dirt. Someplace we've lost this feeling of gratitude. Get this, I'm going to mess with you guys now. Sometimes we go out there and eat, and our waiters or waitresses, they're serving us diligently, and they're bringing us drinks, and they're cleaning off the tables, and they're, they're getting jelly for us to put our biscuits up at uh, Cracker Barrel. I mean, they, they do all that stuff. And we get ready to go, and we don't bother to leave a tip to even say thank you. Where did thankfulness go? People refuse to honor God. All you got to do is watch a football game right now. It's spread across America. Everybody wants to take a knee to make a statement. And in reality, what they're showing is disrespect. Friends, it is time for us to begin giving respect where respect is due. There's a lot of times you see people walking out of Walmart Anymore, they open and close the doors themselves. What's another store? It's got doors. The Dollar General. <laughs> you know, one of those, and, and they, let, they, they open the door, and then they just let it go. Wham! Back on people. You know, there was a day whenever if there's somebody older than you, you went up and you held that door and you said, "Have a good day, ma'am. Have a good day, sir." Not anymore, man. They'll knock you over getting out in front of you. It's just changed. It's not the same anymore. Common courtesy seems to have just plain disappeared. We take for granted all the ways that others help us. And above all, we fail to thank God for his many blessings. I've got news for you. That kind of ingratitude is just plain wrong. Just as surely as lying is wrong, just as surely as stealing is wrong, just as surely as immorality is wrong, all these failures, they cause us to miss the mark that God set for us. The fancy word is hamartia. Forget that one. We translate it with three little letters. It's a lot easier. Sin. We miss the mark. We sin, if you will. And all sin is condemned in Scripture. That includes the sin of ingratitude. God puts it this way in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. He says, For what can be known about God's is plain to them, because God showed it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, had been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise... They became fools. They refused to honor their creator. 
At the very least, being ungrateful is just plain foolish. Especially when you're ungrateful to Almighty God. An ungrateful heart is a heart that's cold toward the Heavenly Father. An ungrateful heart is indifferent to God's mercy. It's indifferent to God's love. He's the one who provides us with absolutely everything. From one end of the Bible to the other, we are commanded to be thankful. In fact, thankfulness comes naturally to a heart that's connected to God. We should give thanks because God has blessed us in so many ways. He has freed us, and I love this, freed us from the guilt and the power and the punishment of sin. God has given us food to eat. Yep. <laughs> a roof over our head. Forgot hair on some of us. And clothes to wear. And boy, you ought to be thankful for that. Unfortunately, far too many of us spend our time comparing what we have to what others have. We're oblivious to the fact that in God's sight, we're all sinners in need of grace. Not one of us is a single bit better than the one sitting next to us. Many times, our comparison causes us to want what others have. Isn't there a word for that? What is that Bible word? I know it. What did you say? Coveting! We want what others have. We covet what they have. All day long, all day long, we look around us and compare. I read a story about a little boy who did exactly that. He had that kind of a longing. He saw something and, and he wanted it. He, he wanted to know about it. He wanted to experience it. All day long, this little boy was forced to work really, really hard in the fields. His people, well, they were really poor farmers. And they didn't have enough money to go out and hire a farmhand. So that little boy would go out with his dad and he would, work, he would work like a dog all day long. Work right alongside his father like a man. Each day though, just before sunrise, his dad would let him have an hour all to himself. An hour that he could just be a boy. That he could just enjoy the world. And that hour that his dad gave him was always right before breakfast. Dad took care of the chickens and the hogs and the other things. And he let that little boy have a little bit of free time. And each morning, that boy would go up to the hill behind their house. And he would look across the valley. And there, on a hillside far away, across the valley, over to the other side, he saw a house every morning that had windows of gold. They shimmered like diamonds in the morning light. Their sparkle was so beautiful that the boy would just sit there on that hill, staring across and wondering what kind of people must have lived in that house with golden windows. When his hour was up, he would head in the house, and he would eat his breakfast, and he would head out to the fields to work with his dad. One day that boy, he had been doing a a bang-up job for his dad out there working in the fields. And one day, that, that father called that little boy in. He said, son, you are one hard-working young man. And I want you to know that you have earned a day off. A day to do whatever you want to do. Here's what I want you to do, son. I want you to take the day off tomorrow. But remember something. I want you to remember that it's God who gave you that day. And when you're out there enjoying that day, I'd like for you to do something. I'd like for you to find something that you can learn from the experience you have. You look for that. Something you can learn. The boy was overjoyed. He thought, me having a day all to myself? This is wonderful. Man, the next day, he could hardly sleep that night. The next day he got up and he thanked his dad. And he went over and he kissed his mama goodbye. And he put a piece of bread in one pocket. And he had his special rock in the other pocket. And off he went. <laughs> He was going to take a trek across that valley and up that hill so that he could see that house with golden windows firsthand. It was a pleasant walk. Man, it was enjoyable. His bare feet, feet you know, he would walk through the dust. He didn't have any shoes on. He looked back behind him and there in the dust he could see his footprints. 
just follow along behind him. He thought, now that's really cool. And then as the sun began to change, he began to notice that his shadow was walking right along beside him. Everything he did, his shadow. And he was just being a boy, enjoying the day. He making little pictures with his hand, having a wonderful time. But as the journey wore on, he began to get just a little bit hungry. There's a pretty stream up ahead. So he sat down there next to that stream, and he ate his piece of bread. He kept just a little bit to feed the birds with. When he got done, he bent down and he got him a drink out of that crystal clear stream of water that was flowing by. Then he scattered a few of those little crumbs for the birds and he watched them eat. And after sitting there for a good while, just enjoying the sound of the stream and, and the birds that were around him eating the bread that he had put out, after sitting there for just a little while, he decided to continue his journey. And he was almost there. He walked over and up that high green hill on the other side of the valley. And when he got to the top, he could see the house. The house that he had longed to see. The house with golden windows. He was so excited. He ran right up to that house. And he looked at the windows. And they looked completely different up close. Well, they weren't gold at all. Those things, they're just glass. Just like, just like on my house. It's just glass windows. A woman came to the door. She kind of creaked the screen door open and said, Son, what, what are you doing? He said, Ma'am, I have walked from the hill far away across the valley because I wanted to see those golden windows on your house. I came to see them, but I got here, and I found out your windows are just glass. <laughs> the woman began to chuckle. <laughs> oh, son, son, we're poor people. Our windows aren't gold, they're glass. Besides that, it'd be hard to see through gold. Glass is a lot better for windows. She had the boy sit down on the front steps. <laughs> and she brought him a cup of milk. And she brought him a cookie. And then she called her daughter. She looked to be about his age. He looked over at her and she was barefoot just like he was. She wore a brown gunny sack dress. You know, they make them out of feed sacks, still got the writing on them. Make nice dresses, though. Had a brown gunny sack dress. But her hair, he saw her hair, and man, his little heart went pity pat. She had the most beautiful golden blonde hair he had ever seen in his life. Every bit as beautiful as the windows that he had been hoping to see. Her eyes they were as blue as the sky at noon on a clear day. She showed the little boy around the farm. She took him out to see her calf. It was special calf. It had a little star right in his forehead. And she thought that was the most wonderful thing. She said, did you see, see my calf? So he told her about his calf. He said, I've got a calf at home that's a chestnut color. And he's got white on, it, on his hooves, just above his hooves. Beautiful young calf. They sat down for a little while. They broke an apple in half. and They shared it. Finally, the boy asked her about the golden windows. He said, I came over to see the golden windows that I can see from, from afar. Have you ever heard of those golden windows? The little girl got so excited she could hardly contain herself. Absolutely, I've seen them, I've seen them. He says, well, I see them every morning. How about you? Oh, no, no, they're not, they're not there in the morning. They're there in the evening. She had seen them too. She knew all about them. And, and she took that little boy up to a hill right behind her house. It was evening time by now. They looked across that valley. And there on the far hill, sure enough, he could see the golden windows. There on a hill far away stood a house. Every bit as beautiful as the one he had seen from afar. What he didn't tell her is that house that shimmered like diamonds, it was his house. It was his home. It's just as he remembered as he looked the other direction. You know, he told that little girl that he really enjoyed the visit. He didn't tell her that that was his house or his seemingly golden windows. But he did say it was getting late. He decided to do something special for her, so he took his little pebble out of his pocket. It was a white one. had a little red band that ran right across it. It had been in his pocket so long that it had rubbed itself smooth. It was silky smooth. He gave it to her so that she would never forget their visit. 
She had carried that pocket for a long time. It was hard for him to give up, but she was a special girl. She gave him chestnuts, three of them, <laughs> kind of to remind him about the calf they talked about, his chestnut calf. And then he finally got up the nerve to kiss her on the cheek and promised that he would come again. But he didn't tell her anything about his home. It was a pretty long journey back. And by now it was getting really, really dark. But the lamp lights of his house lit those windows up so that they were almost as bright and beautiful as he had pictured them from afar. When he opened the door to his home, his mother ran up and kissed him. His sister ran up and threw her arms around his neck. His father looked up and smiled. And his mom asked, did you have a good day? His response was immediate, absolutely, Mom. It was a wonderful day. His dad looked at him and said, Son, did you learn anything? He says, I sure did, Dad. I learned that our house has windows of gold because it is a loving home. Friends, we are truly blessed. The Apostle Paul declared in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. And now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned, now get this, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Friends, a spirit of thankfulness makes all the difference in the world. Are you preoccupied with what you don't have? Or have you learned to thank God for what you do have? Are you constantly wishing you had a little bit of what your neighbor has? Or are you content with, God, with what God has given to you? Isn't it time for us to quit comparing ourselves with others? Isn't it time for us to count our blessings and to say, just as we said in the beginning, Thank you, Lord.